Well, welcome, and glad you're here. And we're gonna be looking at RMS and some of the statistics required so that your books not only meet, but exceed the specifications for ACX books. Now, if you've been on, on, on the Facebook groups or any place else, and you've seen the specs for ACX, you know that you know we have peaks at minus three, we have a, a dynamic range that we need to come into for our audio, which is gonna be between 18 and minus 23. They're all negative numbers. So sometimes if I skip the negative, you know what I mean there. And then we have a noise floor of minus 60. And there's controversy about that. And what you're gonna find out is there's this whole bizarre thing that the more people you talk to, it's almost the more confusing it can be because some people are taking and using an average for the noise floor. Some people like me use peak. Some people do all sorts of very interesting things. I'm going to put on my glasses here. And I don't like having my glasses on because I glare a little bit. And I've got two, multiple monitors sitting here. And uh, so if I look away, that's because I'm looking at my other monitor for just a second and back. But I just I, I need to give you a couple disclaimers here. And that's that not everybody cares about quality. Now, they should, but not everybody does. And, you know, you almost... You almost should stop watching now because some of the things I'm going to say are going to bother some people. Some people are probably going to unfriend me when we're, when we're done. Now, ACX has, you know, last time I checked, 28,000 producers. Most aren't technical. If you talk to them in private, they will tell you that most people are using free software or low-cost software. And they really just don't want to learn a whole lot about the technical side of it. They want to read. They want to, you know, this is what they want to do. And you're going to hear this myth or people who want to say, look, you know, this is good enough. And one of the reasons they'll give you is, well, my audio has never been kicked back from ACX. Well, you know, my response to that tends to be so. You may have excellent audio. You could have excellent, excellent audio, and it won't necessarily get kicked back. You also can have marginal or worse audio because they do not listen to every book. They, they, they have automated software that just verifies that the head and the tail and the noise floor at the beginning and at the end is fine, but they're not listening to the whole book. They spot check different things. And so people get stuff through there that I, I see it afterward. They come to me so we can evaluate a specific issue and we find out how did this get through? You know, this shouldn't have gotten through, but it did get through. And I can tell you categorically, they don't check most of your books. And if they do, they're checking for volume and not for quality. They just don't have time. They just don't have time. Now, you also get some people that will tell you that they're, well, my rights holder loved it. You know, they said, oh, this sounds great. Well, let me tell you a problem with the rights holders. I'm gonna write, I have a couple books. I wrote the book. If you narrate it, I'm going to love the book because I'm hearing my words, my concept, my story. But that does not mean the quality of my audio is great. Don't trust rights holders. Don't take that as that, you know. Don't break your arm because they like your book. That's great. You hope they like it, but that's not definitive. It doesn't mean you have great quality. It means they like hearing their words back to themselves. All right. It's like my mom likes my work. All right. I've got a dog. If I want an affirmation, I call Riley over. Hey, hey, I don't even have to call him. He'll come over and tell me how great I am. Uh, but that's about the equivalent. So don't let your rights holders opinion or your friends. You know, no one said my audio is bad. There is this one thing that happens on the boards all the time. You post something that's just marginal or worse, and you ask for opinions. Well, first thing, most people don't want to tell you the truth. They want to tell you, they, they'll pick out the couple things that they like, and they're going to tell you about those. I don't want to live in front of a bunch of other people say, well, you've got these six things you need to deal with. And your more experienced, more mature people will say very little because they get beat up if they tell you the truth and you have this other problem that other people will say, I don't hear that. I don't hear it. Well, here's the issue. People don't know what they don't hear. And they, it's only after the fact. You talk to somebody that's been in this business for six months or a year, they'll tell you, ah, I'm hearing all this stuff. I never heard mouth noise before. Now I hear mouth noise. Wait, till you've been doing this five years. I've got like four decades of ear training and listening. But the more you do it, the more you hear. And you don't need to hear everything or, or take everything out of your book, but you need to be aware of it and set the bar higher than what you think for this reason. If I say the word um, 
or so, that's the word, whatever. If I say my nonsense word, at first it doesn't bother you. And if we're talking for two minutes or three minutes like this so far, it probably wouldn't bother you anyway. If I continue to say it over the course of a conversation that runs 30 minutes or 20 minutes, you notice it and it starts bothering you. And if there's something in your audio, there's an underlying noise, there's a fan noise, there's something, your, your noise floor is too high, somebody who listens for five minutes, listens to your demo, is not going to usually be bothered. But most of them also won't finish your book or buy another one by you if your noise floor is too high. So we're going to talk about the specs. Uh, you also get some people, uh, I hate to say this, I'm older. I, I'm, I qualify for the senior discount at Denny's, okay? So go look it up. You'll see. I just, just, I just hit that milestone here recently, and I don't know if I'm proud of it. It just doesn't matter. But here's the thing. My contemporaries, people that are 40 and above, a lot of them do not hear as well as they think they do. If you, I use reading glasses these days, okay? Now, if you're, if, if you're like me or if you've ever had this happen, and if you haven't worn glasses yet, if you, get, if you live long enough, you will, you get to this one point where it's like you don't realize that all of a sudden everything's a little bit fuzzy, and then you put these on, you go, gosh, the world is really clear. Now, these are only, I think these are 0.5 or 0.1 or 1 or 0.5. They're the minimal. I think they're ones. They, so they're, the, the, the big issue is that I didn't realize my eyes were deteriorating until after I put on my glasses and go, gosh, that text is really, really easy to see now. Hey, my computer is a lot clearer now. And it's after the fact that I realized my eyes aren't as good as they used to be. And everybody goes through that. It's normal. And so when you have somebody else say, uh, boy, you know, it just needs to be a certain level, you need to measure it and you need to find somebody you trust to do an evaluation if you want to shoot for above average slash excellence. Because most people don't hear very well. And then you have some young people who are listening to earbuds and, and because they've been doing that with music that's been too loud since the time they've been 10, their hearing is not what it should be either. Now, I also don't hear anything above about 18K. I've done, I do audio tests every couple of years just to see where my hearing is at. And, but I can see it. And I've had so many years of doing things in terms of audio that as long as I can see it, and it doesn't apply to audiobooks. It's only when you're doing music where you need that upper end. We're cutting everything off on the high end, so it doesn't matter. But here's the point. A lot of people that'll tell you your audio is great or either Tony or the Tiger, they say it that way, or they don't necessarily hear everything. If they don't have trained ears, they won't hear a whole lot. If they've never recorded music or spent some time playing music, chances are their hearing is just okay. It's, a, it's an acquired skill and takes years to develop to the point where you start hearing things that virtually nobody else is hearing. And audio engineers who do music have to make a hundred little decisions about is the vocal going to be a little higher than the bass guitar, higher than the drums? Where higher, lower in terms of volume? Am I going to put the guitars? How, which side? You know, they're, they're listening to all these subtle things, and they spend time understanding and listening to the blend of all these instruments and figuring out which should be a little higher and a little lower and making these micro adjustments the whole time and, and learning to hear it all while all of it's playing. So it's kind of an art. It's definitely an art but it's also something that somebody else doesn't necessarily hear. So don't take that, you know, nobody else says yours is bad. One, measure, and I'll show you how to measure in just a minute. Two, find somebody you trust if you really want to know how you're doing and understand that when you go ask for public feedback, all I'm gonna tell you in public is the things I can find to do well and then generalize. Well, you could probably treat your room a little better. Well, I hear a little echo in the background. Um, if you want a detailed response from somebody, unfortunately, you're gonna probably have to pay them because in public or for free, I ain't going through and, and having the possibility of you hating me for telling you the truth about this, 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 and this, because there's no there's no payback in it. And publicly, I don't wanna tell someone that oh, that's terrible. It's not gonna happen. In private, if someone's paying me, and this is the same for all the instructors, I feel an obligation to make sure that you know and you're making a decision. And if you wanna skip something, cool, that's fine but we're not gonna go ahead and just uh, do it. And then you're gonna hear other people that say, well, you know, if you overdo this, you do too much of this tech work, then you're just wasting your time. 
and okay, that's true. That's true. There's a balance, but all of us are working on tips and tricks and how to do things better. And here's the little secret. You can learn to do this stuff in a couple months. I don't care if you're starting from zero, you can learn the technical aspects of it. You won't have the perfect hearing. I mean, that takes years to develop, but you can learn from anybody and I can teach somebody in a couple months and their stuff will be in the top 10, 20%, right up there in the top and you don't need to take extra time. If you learn to punch and roll, for example, you cut so much time out of your editing process that you don't need to spend extra time to get higher quality. And the one thing is anybody can cut the time and the processing if they're willing to cut the quality. A lot of people don't listen back to their audio at the very end. So let me show you some things about how I measure. Let me show you some things that are objective. Let me go through the specs individually with some audio so we can look at it and we'll measure it. I'll use a couple tools. You can use some different tools. Don't get hung up on which tool I'm using, whether that applies to you or not. But you know, make sure that just because other people say, well, that's good enough, you know, I'm going to give you off a few people's Christmas list, but a lot of these people, if they're my age or more, their hearing is not all that great. It's some of the people that are younger have been listening to stuff and they, they, they don't realize it, but they don't hear as well. So be careful who you listen to. I'm going to show you some ways to objectively measure it. And we're going to talk about noise floor. We're going to talk about averages. And uh, those are the two that kind of really get people there. And we'll just make sure we cover the ACX specs. And then I'll be sure that I'm, I'm listening and looking at the, um, let me go ahead and get my questions and answers that are up here and just see if anybody's got anything that I need to address here right at the beginning. And so, hi Beth, and hey John, and hey Ellen. Uh, Nancy's there, and you're 30, nice, yeah, yeah. Now I'm 55, so that's the Denny's discount. And I really, I went to, I went to dinner with my mom, they gave us the senior discount, and it was really, really a, a, a slight downer when I realized I mean, she's in her 70s. So of course she gets a senior discount. And when I realized that I qualified and my mom qualified at the same place, I just said, hey, your senior discounts, your age is a little too low, uh, but whatever, that works fine. I can live with that. And hey, Mike. All right. So I got some questions coming in here and uh, we'll go through and check this out. Now, don't get hung up on what software I'm using. I'm using Studio One and I'm gonna use and I'm gonna measure with RX, but that's irrelevant. Um, just two tools that make it easy. And I'm gonna let me screen share here. We'll go over to this screen. And so screen sharing will turn on for you right now. Now, here's the way this works. I have some audio here. Now this is a raw audio track. So this is raw, okay? And it's even labeled raw, okay? Now behind the scenes here, I have some other tracks here and I'll show you those in a minute. So how do you do it? So, I, I'm in this habit and I don't really need to do it anymore, but before my audio starts, there's four seconds of blank audio sitting right here. So let me go ahead and highlight that for you. And that's roughly four seconds right there. And I just, before, I, I'm just in the habit, I started doing this really early on, where at the very beginning and then at the very end, oh, I cut off I, for the demo, uh, I cut off the rest of this because this file was, I don't know, 15 minutes. And because I just decided I, I didn't want so much for the, for the demo, I cut it off. But at the very end, I put another five seconds of room tone. So at the beginning and at the end, I have five seconds of room tone. And I can always use that. Now, frankly, I don't need to do that. Why? Because I have room tone that if you're in the same room and you're recording under the same circumstances with the same mic, the same interface, and the same way every time, you can save your room tone from session to session but I still as a safety belt, belt and spender, suspenders type of guy, I still have a habit to put four or five seconds up front. And then I cut it down to ACX standards, which is leave only a half a, half a second. I put a, just barely over a half second at the beginning of mine, but I don't need to have this room tone because what you can't see here is I actually have a another, uh, it's right here. This track here is my room tone. And this is the same as, as when I record my room. I just recorded this a month ago or six months ago. I don't even remember anymore. But that room tone always sits there in case I needed a chunk of it. Then I might have, what do I have there? I probably have uh, 11 minutes of it and I could duplicate it if I needed more. But the point is simple. 
it is a best practice to go ahead and put a few seconds of room tone in there in before you're recording and at the end. And then your editor, either you or somebody else, has that if they need it. And we're going to measure that in just a minute. So what I'm going to do is people say, well, you record and let's get to room tone and let's measure it. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So what I'm going to do for you here is I'm going to export some room tone. I'm going to leave it there in the, the location. I'm going to put out a wave file. I've got 30 seconds here. We'll just make sure we go out in mono and boom, I'm going to get this and it's going to come up and there's, there's my wave file. That's 30 seconds worth of this audio. This is raw audio. And a lot of people, I'm going to go over here and throw it into RX and let me close this first. So here's my 30 seconds of audio. It doesn't matter. You don't need RX to do this. And what's interesting is when you look at it, I mean, do this, minimize this guy, I'll get rid of him. If you look at it in the DAW, this looks really clean. Looks like nothing's there, okay? So, and that's what everyone would assume, that nothing's there. Of course, that's because I'm all the way zoomed out. Now I can zoom in on this, and if I zoom in far enough, then all I'm doing here is a visual zoom. But if I zoom in, what you do see is at the very beginning right here, look at, there's a bunch of little noise here. And if I go over this way, you're going to see some more noise that's sitting right here at the beginning. So there was some noise in this beginning. And if I were to just grab this whole thing and not pay attention, I could get some room tone that has a little bit of noise that is just before it. Now, that's not a lot because I'm, I'm very zoomed in and there's how it looks normally. But I also, so let's check this, watch this. So we look at this here and let's get a, let's get a light, kind of the, an overview. So this software and virtually all, lots of software has the ability to measure some of the stats about this. Oh, I did that. I did. I made a mistake. I can tell. Just look, look, look at these numbers. Okay. So it's telling me that um, I had a, a limiter sitting on there. Just I can look at these numbers and instantly tell you, whoops, that was wrong. <laughs> and I'll show you why in a second. All right. This is the great thing about doing something live is that look at this. My RMS level, it's even over. I'm going to check something here. Let's go and see where we got this. And when I look at that, I instantly can go, uh-huh. There we go. That's right. By the way, if you use RX4, they fixed this in RX5, which is coming out. If you're watching this live, RX5 is out of practice sometime in October. So it could be next week or four weeks from now. There is a bug in RX4. If you go back and forth between stereo and mono files, which most people don't, but I do because I work with a lot of different people's audio, then there is a thing and it's documented and I can tell you how to get around it. But anyway, you see this at 19? That's because this went through some processing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of that guy. I'm going to reprocess this. So this is because my template will take my raw audio and without me thinking of it, I don't know, did anyone really notice there that without thinking of it, my audio just met all the ACX specs. There's my peak level at minus 3.01. Here was my total RMS. Some programs will call that average RMS. And it was looking over the complete file. And I shoot for between 19.5 and 20.5 as my total RMS level. Now, I haven't shown you the noise floor part yet, but this total, this 30 seconds of audio perfectly came into specs. I didn't do anything because I have it all set up in advance. I'm not always right. Sometimes this will be off by one and I have to make one change and then it'll meet the specs. So if your software, if you don't have a chain set up that will automatically meet the specs, then you should. But what I'm gonna do is turn off all my processing. So when I output that, so let me output this again and you'll see the difference, watch this. Now I'll output this guy, change him over here to make sure I get a mono file out, go okay. The second one will come up and I'm gonna go and take this guy and I'm gonna throw them in RX, and we're gonna do the same thing. Okay, so this was my raw audio here. And my raw audio, well, it was a little quieter. You'll see, for example, total RMS. This is something that's important to you. This is out of spec. And we remember we deal with minus number, negative numbers, minus numbers, negative, negative numbers, say the other way. Don't, don't say it the other way. Say negative numbers. I don't know if there is something called minus numbers, but I'll call it negative numbers for today. We deal with these minus signs. If I skip it and just say 26, yeah, interpret for me. If I just say four, then I always, I'm always talking negative numbers here. But we need to be, you already know this, between minus 18, which is louder, 
to minus 23, which is quieter. We need to be there. So this does not meet ACX standards, but it's my raw audio. It's not been processed. And so what I want to do is I can also measure just a little section. So here's how you start measuring your noise floor. I'm going to set this over here. You find a little section of it here. Now you'll notice, let me turn up the intensity here. I can adjust this. It's, it hasn't changed the audio. It's just changed the display. So you can see a little more dirt in here. I'm going to take this full screen so you have a better chance of seeing it. And I'm just making it brighter. And it's just for the demo, I'll make it brighter. I'll probably turn it back a little later. And you can see there is something in here. There is something in here. There is a little bit in here. That's all right. Now, what some people will do is they'll take the raw audio, they'll throw it in, and there's two places that you can measure. Technically, look at this, minus 82.1 dB. Now, you might not be able to read that on your screen, so I'll read it for you. Total RMS in this little sliver here, and this is what you need to do. Instead of taking my opinion, oh, is this good or bad? Let's, let's get some real numbers behind it. And real numbers wise, this total RMS is what some people use for, and this is easy. They will, they will use this number, total RMS or average RMS, and they'll use that for their noise floor. And technically, that will get you by ACX. So let me repeat that. You can use total or average RMS level, and that will get you by the ACX standards. Okay? Now, I don't do that. And most of the people I know that are experienced engineers are using this peak level. I don't want anything to peak. But remember, this is my raw audio. And remember, if I if I I'm at, I just ask it to measure the whole this whole 30 seconds, I'm too quiet. So what's going to have to happen is that this being I'm going to have to go up at least roughly 6 dB in order to get this to close to 20. I want to come in right in at about 20, and then my peak level peak levels will change. And when I do that, my noise floor is all, also going to change. So this is an interesting thing. This just tells you that my room, when we record raw, is at minus 67. But you can't only measure in one spot. You need to find a few other spots here and verify that it's the same. And so I'll go over here and I'll measure here at 68. And once I get confirmation a few times that I'm at 68, 69, then I say, oh, that's that's pretty darn good. Okay, so that's my raw room. Now most people don't have a room that's quite that strong when it's totally raw. That's okay. As long as I'm kind of peeking out here at the 60, not total RMS. You notice the delta between those two in this little tiny sliver. There's there's a big difference there. That's 13, 13, 14 dB of difference between the peak level and the RMS level. And once again, if you want, if you don't care, and it's okay, I mean, if, if your business decision says, get it out the door and I don't care, then you can have this total RMS at minus 60. I have, I, I've never put out a book for one of the major publishers, personally. I've, near, I've, I've edited for countless people where my audio is going to Blackstone or one of these major publishers and they won't accept the ACX specs. It just doesn't work. So what I what I shoot for is getting things that would work across the board for all the publishers. And my goal is excellence. I don't always hit it, but that's my goal. That's what I recommend for you too. But you notice that what I'm doing is I'm measuring little slivers, but it it's this is just my starting point because it's my raw audio with no processing. And when I measure the whole file, I'm not within specs. Until I get this number, the total RMS or the average RMS for the whole file into the range, and then these other numbers don't matter, okay? And then this number is just an interesting point that I'm starting at 67. For the peak level, some people are doing this down here, and when they do that, they it will be heard in their book by a majority of the people who are listening, not just you know, a few people. And people tell you that they can't hear 60. Well, they don't have reasonable hearing. I mean, people all over the place have hearing that is diminished for a hundred reasons. Either their age, they're my age or more. They've listened to some things that they didn't realize were gonna damage. They went to Woodstock when they were young. They'll be a little older for that. But nonetheless, they've done some things over their life and their hearing is not as good. So be careful who you listen to. This is an objective thing, but 
if you want to meet the minimums, then you can, as long as this is at minus 60, you're gold. I never do that. And the, uh, the other engineers I know that are worth their weight, they are not doing that too. They're looking at their peak level and they don't want that to go over. I shoot, and I'll tell you, this is my target. My target is minus 68 to minus 72 for the true peak, okay? Minus 68 to minus 72. That's where I want my room tone to peak out at. I guarantee you it'll get by every single publisher well, that I know of. Maybe there's some I don't know about. But all the majors that I've already had to submit audio to, they love it. It works great. And I don't even look at this number in terms of noise floor. I do look at this total RMS, which mine here is sitting at minus 82, but it doesn't matter. This isn't final. This isn't up to, to the total RMS level that we have to get. So let me go ahead and put one out that does that. I'll go back to my audio here. And I'm going to turn on my inserts. So I have some tools here. This is changing my EQ. I've got an expander, a limiter. I've got some things that are going on there. And I'm going to output. I just turn those on. And then when I go ahead and export that, I'm going to make sure I always do mono here. Boom. I get my 30 seconds of audio. It tells me it's this one right here. I go and drop it into RX. And now what's happened is that all my audio has come up. And so now check this out. My total RMS is 19.64, and that falls within my standard range. I'm always shooting for minus 19.5 to minus 20.5. Uh, that's the range I shoot for. And if you're 1 dB within 1 dB up or down on the chapters, nobody can hear it, okay? especially when we're dealing with this average. That's a great range to shoot for. If you go and you are too quiet, you're in the 22s, the 23s, you will still pass ACX specs but they do more processing on your audio because they want it to be up closer to this. If you are closer to the 18 end, somewhere in the 19 to 20, you will get better output at the other end of the ACX meat grinder. We'll call it sausage maker. So, but watch this. I'm gonna remeasure this noise floor here. You notice now this noise floor is at 64 and then you can't measure it just in one spot. So you'd need to double check it over here and verify over here. And you see that now I'm still at 79 here, but oh, what's the, but, and then I will take that and measure in multiple places. And of course, if I had a real file that I was outputting that was 15 minutes and I had the very end, I would have a tail that also has an extra five seconds at the end. And I would check that as well. So I make sure that in all cases I verify more than one, verify at the very beginning where I sat there quietly before I started recording. Some people advocate you even leave the room because a lot of times if somebody's sitting there, they think they're being quiet and they're breathing and their stomach's growling and they accidentally, they, they don't realize that I'm actually rubbing my shirt. You can't, you can't see me, but if I, if I move around and I, I would never wear the shirt I have on right now, I'm moving around. Maybe you, you probably can't hear that over the hangout. But my, my microphone would certainly pick up if I scratch my shirt like this. I'm scratching my shirt. Uh, if you scratch your arm or hand, you just, we do all this stuff just without thinking about it. It's part of life. And so you have to really be quiet for this. But then I'll measure other spots to make sure. And once I get three or four spots that all come in, then I go, you know what? That works just fine. Now, for me personally, because I have an expander in there, by the way, don't use a gate. Um, I should, let me show you this. Here's what some people do. They, they do what I call cheat. Now that's okay. I mean, if they want to do that and they don't want to listen then that's cool, what you can do is you can actually go and do something called silence. And what I just did here, if I measure this, this is at minus infinity. It just means the computer can't figure out how quiet it is. There's no number that it can assign because there's nothing there. And that's, True silence, I could do it here too, so you can just see the process. I'll process, I'll throw in silence there. Okay, now, what's the problem with this silence? I'll tell you what the problem is with silence. It's this, people hear contrast. And it doesn't matter if they're trained or untrained, too much contrast is noticeable. Um, if you jump into water that's too cold, you instantly know it's too cold. If you're out in the pool in the summertime, if it's cold, if it's closer to you know body temperature, there's not a, you don't shock the system. But you jump into ice water when it's a hundred degree day. Well, let's take it. You jump into sixty degree water when it's a hundred degree day. It's really cold, 
And then if you happen to be a day that it was 30 degrees out and you jumped into 60, it's just, it feels warmer. So it's a relative thing. And this is too much. And everybody in the country, whether they have good hearing or not, if I go through here and I put silence in, I don't even know where that command is on here because I just don't ever use it. I have to go look it up from the menu. I don't have keystroke shortcuts for all this stuff. But that is, quote, the technical term for that is bad because you're playing along here and all of a sudden the bottom drops out. And to be honest with you, this does not occur in nature. There is no, there just isn't a place you can go in nature where there isn't some sound. And if I stop talking and when we're done with this, just sit quietly, quote unquote, wherever you are for a second and listen closely to what you can hear around you. There are little fan noises. There are no outdoor noises. Go outside sometime and listen. And when you think it's calm, you'll be blown away at how much noise there is, even just air moving around and air conditioners. It's just always around us, but we don't hear it because we become accustomed to it. Well, this is an unnatural sound. And so people that are untrained will still hear that. And I'll take those back out. And so now you can see this. And by the way, if my display was normal, uh, you, even when it's normal, there's still just a little bit of evenly distributed noise throughout the whole spectrum. And there's a little bit of extra at the bottom here, but that's so quiet that no one will ever hear this. So I don't worry about it. And I, and then I haven't been through my denoising yet. I'm gonna still bring this down another because I don't like minus 65. I told you I want minus 68 or better. And so I'm gonna bring it down a few. And if you're using a good quality denoiser, it's also gonna take it out behind the words because anybody can take out noise between words. That's easy. The real art to this is being able to take out the noise that's behind. And the dirty secret is, while the average listener will not hear that noise behind there, if I have too much contrast between this noise or lack of noise, so I have an expander, some people use a gate. Uh, I'll tell you uh, categorically, do not use gates in this type of thing. But my one caveat is that a gate is not a gate is not a gate. Some gates can also do expansion and they're called a gate, but they actually are expanders. And I'm not gonna get into the weeds on exactly why that is. But if you have a question, you know, ask me someplace. And um, so the, the point is this, don't use gates. There are a couple gates that actually work as expanders. There are some software that call something one thing and they have other functionality. But as a rule, a gate is gonna give us the equivalent of that silence and we don't want that much contrast. This has just enough noise in there, and but there's noise behind all the words. And at first, in the first couple minutes, people don't hear it. But what I talked about earlier, if I say the word um enough, you'll pick up on it and it will start to bother you and it will fatigue you and it will annoy you. So if there is noise behind your words, some people will not hear it. The vast majority won't hear it really, it depends on how loud it is. But once they pick up on it, then they will hear it the rest of the book. And if it's too much, it will fatigue them and they just, they'll stop listening at some point. Furthermore, I have this little thing that, um, well, let me go, let me, let me finish this out first. Let me, let me go through it and go back and, and show you a couple other things about this. Um, but our, let's talk big picture and then I'll take some questions and see if anybody, um, if any, if I can answer any questions, because it's a good point to do that now. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to measure your stuff in multiple places, and you're going to verify that you're at minus first one. I use peak, and you'll get some people that'll argue with me, but just check their credentials, check their, find out what they know about their hearing, and see if there's somebody that works on the lowest common denominator. Uh, don't use, I'm just going to tell you, don't use total RMS or average RMS, but you will get through the ACX specs. But what I promise you is too many people will hear it. Number two, measure in multiple places and look at your peak value and see that they all come out the same. Some people will get fooled at the very beginning and then their air conditioner kicks on and they don't realize it. They don't hear it. They don't notice it. That's the kind of noise that people don't hear. And I'll get to somebody's audio and five minutes into it, I can tell their air conditioner kicked on and they never heard it. And then you need a good quality denoiser. And so somebody asked, does SoundForge have a denoiser? You know, it depends on which version, uh, but frankly, the denoisers that are part of um, uh, Islandon, 
they're a part of the, the denoisers that are part of the uh, uh, DAWs are all just okay. Nobody has a great one. Uh, but in your situation, if you have very light noise, if your room is well treated, then it might be good enough. If you really want a great, great denoiser, you have to go with something like RX or something called Akon. Also, they do a good job with their denoiser. The RX one is more sophisticated. The RX has other tools like spectral repair that's just gold. When you get a click or a noise in a word, you can stop and take it out. So I'm a big RX fan. Anyone knows me, I'm a, I'm a nutcase about it. Uh, there's a new version coming out here in another month. But um, it, it's, it's the gold standard for denoising. So there are some other things that, that, um, you, know, that you can get out there. So somebody asked uh, Eva, if I passed ACS inspection, it's all good. I tend to think now, I think to think now, you know, if you pass ACS inspection, I think I mentioned this earlier, your audio might be great and it may be marginal and it may be substandard or because they don't listen to everything. They're not going to listen to everything. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of you can't trust that just because they have said your audio didn't get kicked back, then, um, you know, it's, it, that your audio is good. And then, uh, need how you just slide over to RX and open. Was that, um, oh, if, yeah, I, so Beth asked a question here in terms of if I'm in something else, anytime you're, you have a file that's up and you want, you can always just drag it into RX directly and drop it. You can go ahead. And if RX wasn't up, you could, you can hover over this. You can do this on the Mac as well. Both the PC and the Mac allow you to just drag and drop into this. If I'm doing some batch processing and I have the batch processor open, so you have a place here where you could add files. If I have a file open, so I can take and drag them and then they, they show up right in here. There's all these drag and drop behaviors. By the way, if you haven't worked with somebody who knows this stuff really well, I can cut in almost anybody's time 20% for all this stuff because I, I kind of know some of the shortcuts. And you want to learn them because, man, time is important in this stuff. I don't advocate taking more time. I advocate being a lot more efficient with the time you have. All right. So any other questions that somebody has, be sure to throw them up in there. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple other things and we're going to wrap this one up for today because it's actually pretty easy. Um, one of the things is how do you make sure that, that your noise is low? Your number one defense is a well-treated room. You're going to really try to isolate your room. And now this isn't practical. If, listen, if, if this is your first week or your first month or your first couple months, your first two books, you know, anything goes, get it out the door. Get, get some experience, and but expect to refine. So I cut all sorts of slack. If you're new to this, then you're not expected to know all this stuff. It's okay. It's a learning process. So if you're right at the very beginning, don't stress that your stuff isn't all that perfect. If you get it through ACX, then yes, it is good enough when it's your one of your first few books. So that's cool. Uh, you definitely want to go ahead and get what you can through and because you need some experience. There's just so many things that you need to learn and nobody knows them all at once. No stress. If you've been doing this a year and you've got 10 books or more under your belt, then your stuff should be coming in at a much, much higher standard than the new person um, in my mind. Now you can ignore me, that's fine. But then if you, if you have dreams or aspirations to work with some of the other publishers that are out there beyond ACX, then you definitely need a higher quality audio. So your first defense is a well-treated room. And if you're not sure, there's so many resources out there that can help you with that. Then your second defense is this. I see this all the time. People hire me to edit their audio and I'll go over here. And what happens is they actually record too quiet. So I'm gonna take this and you see that? Look at the, this. I just turned down the volume, by the way. I can adjust my volume of my audio by dragging this up and down. I could have selected all of it. Let me see, let me undo that get that back to normal. And so now I've got it all and I can adjust the volume. This is adjusting the volume up and down of all my audio if I chose to do that. So I can bring it up and bring it down and get me closer to ACX standards. If you remember, that raw audio is not enough. And behind the scenes here, after it's gone through RX, I've got all sorts of, uh, then you'll see that this was my raw audio and this is what it looks like 
after it's gone through and been processed through some denoisers and declickers. And you can see the difference. Let me get them both the same. Let's get them both the same here. Shift, shift. And then I'll adjust this one and they'll both adjust together to be the exact same height. And then so now you see them. And oh, I had raised this one already. I've got the control like this. And I can do this. And good thing I know these shortcuts. All right. Got that all back to the original. So here was my raw audio that started off from when I recorded. Here is my final audio after it's gone through and it's meeting all the ACX specs. And you can see that that audio is much taller and uh, it's not any wider, but it's definitely taller because it's louder. It had to be, if you remember when we were looking at the specs, it was below in volume, it had to come up. And when it came up, my noise floor would come up. But then when we measure the noise floor, because I'd run it through RX, it's been denoised. And this noise floor that's sitting right here is going to be at about minus 68. Uh, I really should show you that after the fact. I didn't really do that. Let me do that one time. Watch this. I'm going to output this, which is a final here. And I'll show you what the stats that I got from a final uh, after the fact. I've got that one, that one. Boom. We do that. And so now I'm going to I output my final. And I run it over here. And then what you're going to see is that I'm at minus 19 for my total RMS. And then I'm at minus 308 for my peaks. And then if we go in here and we measure our noise floor between things, that's minus 72. But I don't ever trust in one spot. We do here, that's minus 73. It's probably a little quieter than I might do in some circumstances. But I don't trust any one spot. So I'll go around and if I had done a couple minutes of it, I would go through and make sure that I get slivers all over to see. And you'll see that when a breath comes up, look at that, that breath goes to minus 45 in terms of the peak. The RMS is up there. If I have in, if I move this little box and I zoom in here so you can see a little bit more, let me zoom in on this and I'll make it brighter. Look at this, there's a little, little sound that's right here. That's kind of a clickish thing but I'm gonna brighten the intensity so you can see it a little better there. So now there's that. Now watch when I measure this, that's at minus 66, which is fine when it peaks at minus 66, you want your peaks no higher than 60, but my total RMS is 83. And so remember, I'm way, way stronger in terms of total RMS, but even if there's a little noise in here, so just because I see it, doesn't mean that it's actually something that I need to take out or you need to take out and put it back to its normal. I'd see that and I'd measure it. You measure, 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 measure. Use something that gives you statistics and measure. And I can take this and I measure every place. Now I've measured so many things, I can usually visually look at them now and you can too. Once you've done enough of this, you can visually look at it and you go, yeah, that's cool, that'll work. I don't get worried and bothered by this stuff down here at the bottom because it's all within specs. So there's my final audio comes in. And because I've got all this stuff, I do punch and roll. So I eliminate a whole bunch of time on the front end in terms of editing. I have automated processes that are working both in Studio One and whatever software you're using. You can have a stack that will go ahead and help you meet the specs without having to think about it. And then I go over into RX and I've got my batch processes that I'll de-click and denoise and take care of things and make sure that I'm within specs. So you can make it system you can create a system so that every time you don't have to think about it very much and uh, all you need to do is simply do your job focus on the read the tech stuff fades in the background and i don't take any more time than a lot of these people now that that kind of say well good enough is good enough the one thing that i do find some of these people do is they don't listen to their audio when they're done meaning they do all this processing and they don't listen all the way through but they should so I'm gonna stop sharing that screen there and I'm gonna tell you a couple more things. So your first defense, of course, is your room. You want your room uh, at the best possible quality that you can. You want a quiet room. You want, I've got curtains behind me here in this room, uh, hanging on every wall. And by the way, my son's 31 and he's a narrator and he's a couple hundred miles away from me. <clears throat> and he's in a leased house and he records there. So he does some narration and so I didn't want to spend a lot of money on his place. So my mom loves to resale shop. So she went out and found quilts and heavy blankets. And she bought about 15 of them over a few months that she found 
laundered them, put them out in the sun during the summer. So they got bleached out, laundered them a couple times. And we went up and tacked them into a walk-in closet that he had in his place. He's got a killer sounding room with blankets and quilts and stuff that's temporary. We clamped it onto some shelves. We used little tiny finishing nails to put in in a few places where we knew we could patch because he's moving sometime over the next year. And I didn't want to spend a lot of money on his place, but I wanted him to be able to record and not have to think about it. Now, you know, he's a young guy, relatively speaking, and there are other people in the house. And if they're making too much noise, he can't record. It's just he needs quiet, but his room is great. That does not cut every noise out. But as long as the house is quiet, he gets a great sound and a really low noise floor. So it doesn't take a lot of money to do this. As you, If you have a smaller and smaller room, you have to be a little more precise about it. But first defense is the room. The second one is if you record right. And I see people all the time recording too quiet. And if you record too quiet, then when I amplify it to bring it up to the ACX specs for the whole volume, your noise floor comes up as well. And that's where you have to check is after you've amplified and hit the ACX specs for total sound levels, then what is your noise floor at that point? That's critical. So most people are recording too quiet. And if you want, if you record music, and most of us that have come out of music will tell you, record like minus 12 to minus six. And we tell you that for a specific reason, because I'm gonna have 20 instruments playing there. I gotta fit them all in there and I can't go over zero. I can't clip and I need a little bit of headroom. So we have you record a little quieter. If you're doing vo voiceover and narration, you can record and if you go up to minus three, that's an awesome range. And I actually have a limiter on my input so that I can never go over minus one because I don't want to clip. And a good limiter is just a, a very, very fast volume control. So instead of clipping, I have a limiter set up. And if you need help with setting that up, there's a lot of us that can help you do that. And we charge for doing that, getting that all set up. But you can have a limiter on your input if you have a good piece of software that makes sure that you never clip. I don't want to clip because there's some problems with that and creates distortion. But if you can record a little hotter, now have people fooling themselves where they think if they're recording quieter, they don't get the background noise. It's all there because we're going to amplify it anyway. It was there. It was just quieter. You're not hearing it during the recording, but it's there. So get your room in shape. Number two, record right, which means you get the right volume levels and the ratio between your room noise versus your room tone, your quiet, your sound between words. So that's number two. The third defense is good post-processing. It's the third defense. It's not the first one. It's the, it's the one after the fact that you use. And so use something like RX, use something like Akon, Use one of the things that are out there. Some of the programs have a built-in denoiser. They may be adequate for your room. They may be just okay. A lot of them are just okay, but not everyone hears it. Uh, some of them do real well on some things, but they don't get noise behind the words. They get the things between fine. Some of them make the breath sound a little funny. Uh, they're just all over the place. Some of them are also really slow. One thing about RX is it's, it's darn fast, relatively speaking, for the kind of work that it does. Um, so you can do all sorts of post-processing, but that's the number three, okay? So, oh, and then I should tell you a couple, this is a secret, so I've saved it for the very end. I always love at the end, if I can do this, is to give away something that, that um, yeah, I don't tell everybody, but here it is. Since you stayed till the end, you get this bonus. When I played music for a living, as a young guy, I'm in my 20s, we had this rule about every song we did. The first, the opening needed to be spectacular. You got to nail the beginning of a song. You also want to nail the end, okay? So I'm playing drums and the whole band stops and I keep going. Well, it's obvious that Don is a, you know, he messed up. Everybody in the place knows that I just blew the ending. So I want a good beginning and I want a good ending. And if you don't obsess about anything else, if good enough is just good enough for you, here's my recommendation. The first minute or two of every chapter and the first chapter of the book, the opening, the introduction, the first chapter needs to be as clean as humanly possible. Spend extra time there cleaning up your audio. The first minute of every chapter, the first beginning of the book, the first five minutes of it needs to be excellent, excellent, excellent. And then the very end of every chapter, the last minute, because I don't want the last impression that somebody has before they stop and take a break. 
of all my little clicks and pops and whatever in the audio. Does that make sense? Nail the beginning, nail the end of every chapter, nail the beginning of the book, and nail the very last chapter of the book so that the final impression is that all they remember is the story and no technical issues. So that's a starting point, that's a bonus. Now, I kind of have this little arc that I'm just totally ridiculously crazy about the very beginning of the book and the very end. In the middle, my standards, my worst standards are better than 90, I don't know, what, better than most people's best, but it's not the best that I could do. There's a diminishing return. You, if, there's no such thing as perfect, perfect. I've never put out a piece of audio that I haven't looked at or listened to uh, two days later and, and heard something that I could have taken out. So this is not about perfection. That is just not realistic in this game uh, because what you'd need to do is go through it four, five, six times. And no one only listens to your book four, five, six times. They listen to it once or twice at the most. And, and you can have some things that aren't perfect. That's okay. Just make sure that you're using peak levels rather than average levels for your noise if you want excellence. If you don't care, do whatever you want. You, know, you don't have to listen to me, whatever. Uh, if you're if you're listening to people that are a little older, careful. People my age don't always have good hearing, and they don't know it. Okay, I mean I know what my limitations are because I've measured it, and then I visually look at a lot of music. But I mean I take hearing tests to make sure what works, what doesn't, and I know how to compensate for it. And I've got four decades of doing ear training and listening. And if anyone contacts me privately, if you want to improve your hearing, I've taught. I don't know, thousands of people over the years, because I used to teach dancers how the music works. I'm not a great dancer, I'm an average dancer, but I teach some pro dancers how the music works and how to listen. I just had a lot of experience teaching people both music and dance and, tell, and, and helping them develop their hearing, kind of a specialty of mine. But I have some exercises that are so easy that no one does them. And the people that do come back to me six months later just going, I can't believe what I'm hearing these days. So. I'm excited that you, I hope this helped. And I, you know, if it doesn't, tell me. Come find me in one of the groups. I'm in the, the ACX group, of course. I'm one of the admin there. I'm in the RX group. I'm in the Studio One group. You know, I'm pretty easy to find. So be sure to like this. Be sure to put some comments. Share this with other people if it's helpful. Uh, you know, you can check out my channel if you want to see some other things. I teach a bunch of people privately how to do this RX how to tweak their audio, and I'm not the only one. So find somebody you trust, have them help you if you don't have the ears to do it yourself, and then measure, 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 and make sure you're measuring after your audio gets into the range. The reason you measure before you do anything, like my raw audio, is to check your room and make sure your room is good, but that's just the starting point. If your room doesn't start at minus 50 or better, mine's over 60, then you, you're, you're gonna have a tough time because then you better, then you need a really good denoiser. You're not gonna be able to get away with the ones that are just in the DAWs. They're just okay. I don't mean to say anything bad about them, but they're just okay. Uh, if you have a great denoiser, you can get away with it. If you know how to set it and you do your homework, you can do it you find someone that knows about it can get you set up. I've taken out unbelievable stuff and taken really bad rooms and made them sound good but nothing beats having a great room to begin with and being sure that you record right. Those two aspects can solve all sorts of problems. You can probably record louder than what you think. And if you put a limiter on there, you can even, you can even make a bigger positive difference. So I tend to do this almost every week. Join me next week. I'm always happy to see you here. I'm gonna do a last, last, real, uh, uh, last quick look at the questions here. I have to always put on my glasses. Um, just like people don't know what they don't hear, you put on the glasses and you go, oh man, life is so much clearer. And I'll scan this real quick for any last second things to see initial recording should be on the louder scale. Yes, uh, people record too lower, but when, uh... so initial recording should be on the louder scale. Yes, because you're, you're, the issue that you're dealing with, if I wasn't clear on that already, is that I have a certain amount of noise that's gonna automatically be there. And then I'm gonna be record. And if I record too low, then the ratio, if, if, if my noise is at 10 and my audio is at 20, but needs to go to 50, when I bring up my dialogue, I'm going to bring up my noise. 
And then I got to take that out because it's just way too loud. Too many people are going to hear it. And I need to keep my dialogue loud and take out the noise. And so now I've got to subtract. It gets harder and harder for the software. When the noise is as high as the dialogue, the software has a harder time taking out noise behind. This is very difficult. If the volume of my voice is much higher relative to the noise, because the noise is a constant, it's easier for the software to deal with taking out the noise without affecting my dialogue. Because I'm only going to take it down a little bit. I don't have to take it down as much. So definitely, if you can record at a higher level, you will win. And if you're not sure, I mean, remember, people are going to tell you, oh, don't get above minus 12. That, that doesn't apply in this case. It does apply if you're doing music. It does not apply in this case. Most people are recording too low. So people send me stuff. I'm trying to fix their stuff. First thing I do is go, all right, all right. Let's take 15 minutes and look at how your raw audio is. If that's bad, garbage in, garbage out. You make me do way, way more work. I have to do too much work. You're doing too much work. I don't like that. Soundforge, okay. I think I got everything there in the terms of the questions. If, um, if I didn't get something, be sure to go ahead and find me in one of the groups. That's it for today. I'm doing another one of these. I do them every couple of weeks. So I look forward to seeing you on the wires, in the groups. Thank you a lot. I'm glad that helped, Beth. And uh, happy Saturday. And if you're not watching this on Saturday, happy whatever it is. We'll see you on the wires. Have a great day. Share this with some other people. Talk to you later. Bye.